Father God, thank you. Thank you for the privilege to come today with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we have gathered to worship an awesome God. Thank you for your love for us, and may we love you right back. Your will be done as we continue to worship today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you, choir. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, Brenda. One of my favorite songs on the market today, My Trust is in Jesus. My yesterday's gone. My sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood. My goodness, friends, if that don't make this hair stand up on the back of your neck, maybe you haven't been washed in the blood. But praise God, He is alive today. He is alive and real. God is good. All the time. Amen. That's the God that we're serving today. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, today to Luke's gospel. Luke was a doctor, as a matter of fact. He was a very smart man, and uh, he writes a lot of the parables that Jesus used while he was on this earth. Now, let me just give you a little background. You've heard me say from this pulpit, whenever I read and study the Bible, I try to find myself in the Scripture somewhere. And as I was reading and studying and preparing, I'm not so sure if I'm satisfied with who I identify with most in this passage. Because there, there, are, there are four characters involved, four characters, four different directions that the parable goes. And of course, one is Jesus Christ. Oh, I know him as my personal Savior. I love him. He loves me. He Matter of fact, one day he come and got my sins, my 21st century sins, and he carried them to a first century cross, and he paid for them. He paid for my sins. I know him in that respect, but he is holy. He is righteous. He is perfect. So I cannot identify other than he's my Savior with that man. Another man in the parable is, is a man that is sick and uh, uh, very thickly, and uh, he's involved. And I've been blessed with good health all my life, and I can't really identify with him other than he received a blessing of healing from Jesus Christ, and uh, I received a blessing from healing of my sins and forgiveness of my sins. But I can't really identify with him because physically I have good health as far as I know. And then there's another group of people within this parable. Well, it's really two parables. But, and that is the excuse givers. The people that is always excusing themselves for why they're doing what they're doing. For why they are where they are in life. For why they say what they say. These are excuse givers. And somehow I may be a little closer to them than I would like to be. And then, lastly, there are the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were, were, were people that was so religious, and religious can be anything we do. Matter of fact, I uh, eat Tums very religiously. Uh, they were very religious people. And matter of fact, they judged other people. And if you weren't as religious as they were, then you were an outsider. Matter of fact, they judged other people. They only had a group that was like them within their circle. Uh, well, I don't want to identify with those guys, but probably I'm a little closer to them than I would like to be. So what I want you to do today, as we read the scripture, as we go through our outline, I would like for you just to kind of find out where you are in this particular parable. As a matter of fact, I have subtitled my message today, could I be a Pharisee? Could I be a Pharisee? And when I ask myself that question, I, I, I'm closer than I would like to be. Because you see, Pharisees were, were, were very judgmental. They uh, had their own little circle and nobody else was really involved in what was going on in their lives. So hopefully that we cannot identify with them. We may have some of their characteristics, but 
hopefully we cannot identify with them. And we're going to be looking at Luke, the 14th chapter, and looking at the one, first through the 24th verses. Now, we're not going to be reading all of those verses. We're going to kind of fill them in at the outline. But I just want to begin uh, just a little bit with the first few verses of the 14th chapter. And it came to pass. That means it come about. That means it's happening. It came to pass as he, he being Jesus, went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, and they watched him. They watched him. Now, Jesus wasn't supposed to even be invited into this circle because they thought that Jesus was definitely not the Son of God, was not the Messiah that they were looking for. So they had him there for a reason. And you know what that reason was? They watched him there. You know what else they done? They brought in a man that was sickly, and by some Old Testament standards, certainly by Pharisaic standards, was that if you were sick, it meant that God wasn't blessing you, that God wasn't blessing you. So he didn't belong to their little circle, but they brought him in. They invited him. They had him sitting at the table, but they had a reason for bringing him in. Now, before we go further with the passage, let me just show you a little bit uh, about uh, a definition of a Pharisee. Uh, they were members of an ancient Jewish sect uh, noted for their strict observances of the rites and the ceremonies of the traditional law. Matter of fact, boy, you kept that law right down to the T or you was out of that circle. They felt that they were the ones that had the gifts from God and nobody else was included in that. Matter of fact, they kind of felt like this, that they were better than we are. They were better than we are. That's kind of what their feeling was. Jesus addressed that in the parables that he's sharing today. But I like this last part of the definition better than the top part. They were self-righteous. In other words, they meant that they were doing all of the right things and anybody that wanted were doing all of the wrong things. They were hypocritical. You know what hypocritical means or hypocrite means? It simply means that we're pretending to be somebody that we aren't. We're pretending to be somebody that we aren't. We're kind of play acting is what it is. So I kind of identify them with that second thing. Uh, Self-righteous, hypocritical person. So I want to also show you a little bit about the table that they were sitting around. Now this is probably not the way it was, but I just wanted to share this with you. Probably this table is much smaller than their banquet table was. But anyway, they didn't sit in chairs like we do at our meals. They sat on the floor. You saw this in the cry of Christ uh, uh, year uh, after year, and, and that's exactly what they were doing. They kind of sat on a pillow and then kind of reclined. I don't know if I would love to eat like that, but if I get hungry enough, I'll eat any way I want to. I'll eat standing up, laying down, whatever. But anyway, that's kind of what they did. But now I have taken permission to kind of seat these guys, particularly the main characters in the story. Uh, this one standing up, I identify him as being the chief Pharisee. He was kind of telling everybody what to do and how to do what they were doing. And then I identify this character as being Jesus. And then uh, the other character on the other end of the table of being the sick man. Now, why did I do that? Because if Jesus was looking straight into the eyes of the sick man, they set him where that he could not help but see him. And I kind of liked that set up rather than on one of the sides where you had to turn a little bit to see what was going on. And so Jesus was looking right directly at the sick man. Now all of this, we believe, that was set up by the Pharisees. They wanted to see what Jesus would do when he was out of his environment. That's kind of what Satan does. That's kind of the way Satan operates. He wants to see how we respond when we are out of our little uh, circle, when we are out of our, the place that we feel very comfortable in being. We know the people that are there, and we're very comfortable in being around those. Those are the ones we like to party with. So Jesus saw 
the man that was sick. He saw a need. He saw a need. And my friends, Jesus has not changed his characteristics from the day that he was born till the day that he died, to the day that he was buried, to the day that he rose again, to the day that he ascended back into heaven and where he sits right now. He is the same Jesus today as he was yesterday. And when you put him out of what you think is his environment, he's always looking for someone that has a need. You know, our greatest need of healing is being healed for the forgiveness of our sins and accepting Christ as our Savior. That is our greatest need. So Jesus asked a question uh, in the second and third verse, and behold, there was a certain man before him which had the droopsy, and that was a disease, a disease I think is still prevalent today. It's easier to treat now than it was then, I'm sure. In verse 3, And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and the Pharisees. One of the very first conversations recorded in that gathering was the question as Jesus asked the Pharisees, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Is it lawful to do good things on the Sabbath day? Now, there are Sabbath day with the seventh day. It was on Saturday, our Saturday. Is it lawful to do that? And Jesus knew how they was going to respond because he had already, up to this point in the gospel, in Luke's gospel in particular, had worked miracles, had did healings, had given sight on the Sabbath day. And they thought, man, that's awful. This man can't be the Messiah because he's working on the Sabbath day. So they, they, he asked them the question. But here's something that, 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 that I, I have a little trouble understanding why they didn't answer. These were smart people. These were people that really believed in what they were doing was right and what everybody else was doing, including Jesus, was wrong. He asked them a question, is it lawful to heal? And the Bible says, they didn't say a word. They just sat there. Have you ever been around people that you do all the talking and they don't talk? You just kind of wait for them to come in and they don't talk? That gets to be a very uncomfortable position sometimes. Not that I've been there, but uh, that gets to be a very uncomfortable position. But Jesus was not uncomfortable in this setting. He's not uncomfortable in any setting that you find yourself in. He of Savior. He's always looking for someone that needs help and someone that will allow him to help them. I remember one day a long time ago, he saw me in a little country church over in Bedford County. And he saw that I had a need and the preacher had preached and the Holy Spirit had convicted and I went forward and got on my knees and I accepted Christ. I'm glad that Jesus was not just looking for the right people or the good people or the saved people that day. I'm glad that he was looking for me and he found me. And that, my friends, is the Jesus that is sitting right here in the company of a group of Pharisees, judgmental people. He's sitting right in the midst of them. So he asked them a question. They didn't answer. You know what he did? I know you know what he did. I do too. He healed the man that was sick. You know what was wrong with that? In the eyes of the Pharisee, this was the Sabbath day. You aren't supposed to do anything that has any kind of work involved in it. You know, healings by Jesus was not work. That was love. Saving you and me by Jesus was not work. That was love. But here we find these, this group of Pharisees thinking that you should not do that. Now, they did have rules where you couldn't do something on the Sabbath day. One, if your ox fell in a well or fell in a pit or something like that, then you could call your friends and pull them out. But not healing somebody that was sick. Not giving sight to somebody that was blind. That can always wait until tomorrow. That can always wait. That was their characteristic. But when Jesus sees a need, he's Johnny on the spot. He likes to take care of us. 
So let's move on then further in that into the outline. Now, I, I kind of used uh, Keith's format on this, so you don't have lines to fill in on your bulletin. But if you want to take any of these down, you're certainly uh, free to do that. When I left on Friday, or before I left on Friday, you know, I've always told you that Friday evening is my time and God's time. He always, or most of the time, meets me in the office. But for some reason, he didn't meet me on Friday. I struggled all day studying the passage, trying to develop something, but nothing really happened. Nothing really happened. Now, it's not God's a thing when he don't show up. It's my thing. Something wasn't right. Something wasn't right. And somehow I couldn't get it together. But you know the other thing? I couldn't let it go. I couldn't let the scripture go. Because somehow God wanted me to get involved in this scripture. To pick out myself in the scripture. And see if I'm pleased with who I have become as your pastor for some 40 plus years. He wanted me to see that. Now let me tell you something else. There's somebody sitting in the house today that needs to hear this as well. There's somebody sitting in the house today, whether you're out there, whether you're back here, whether you're up there, that, that God wants and knows that they need to take a look at themselves as to where they are and see if they are pleased with that position at this stage in your Christian life. So let's take a look at the invitation first off. In Luke 1, the Pharisees threw a big party and they were inviting their people around and yet they took two outsiders. One was Jesus. One was Jesus. Now they didn't like it. We've already talked about that, so I won't tear too much on that. But somehow they chose Jesus to be invited to this party. They chose Jesus, and then they chose the sick man. Normally wouldn't be involved. They chose these two to be involved in a banquet that they would never have invited before. Many scholars think, and your pastor agrees with them, that this was a setup, that they invited the sick man in just to see what Jesus would do, just to see how Jesus would would respond. Now let me tell you something. Let's carry this a little bit out of the context. When you and I invited Jesus to our banquet, when we wanted to accept Him as our Lord and Savior, when we wanted Him to forgive us of our sins, when we wanted Him to become a part of our lives, we sent out that invitation. He does not come unless we invite Him in. That's when he comes in, when we invite him into our hearts. But when we invited him into our hearts, hopefully that was for all of the right reasons. I'm a sinner. I need salvation. I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness of my sins. And that's why we invited him in. That, my friends, is an invitation that each of us have made somewhere in our lives, particularly as Christians. We've invited Jesus to become a part of our life. Now listen to me. Here's what I wanted to say with that. He comes into our environment regardless of what that environment might be when we invite him into our heart. The Pharisaic invited, uh, environment wasn't where he uh, chose to be, but it's where God planted him. It's where God planted him. And God is still planting the Holy Spirit around in places to encourage people, to help people, and to save people. And let me remind you, whether or not you've recognized them or not, God is in the house today. God is in the house today, and I hope you recognize him before you leave today. The invitation was inviting Jesus to be a part of their environment. This also reminds me that there's no environment that Jesus won't enter in. But listen to me. Whatever that environment might be, he's going to still be Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the Savior of the world. He's not going to change who he is just to be friendly with you and I. He loves us just like we are, but he loves us too much to let us stay that way. So the invitation has been set. 
these Pharisees, they, they, they thought they was doing the inviting. No, God placed things like it was in this banquet time. God places things like they are in your life. Why? Because He loves you. He wants to share a story with you. He wants to help you. He wants to encourage you. He wants you to become a part of who He is. And He wants you one day to spend all eternity with Him in heaven. That's the Jesus that was at the banquet on that particular day. That is who He is. In the life of the Pharisees, in the life of the Baptist, in the life of the pastors. That is who he is. Secondly, we find the watch. These folks weren't there to become friends with Jesus. They were there to watch him. The latter part of the first verse. And they watched him there. Their eyes was upon him. This is the man that claims to be the Son of God, the Messiah. This is the man that is supposed to obey the law. This is the man that's supposed to go by every dot in the law. And he did, only he did it in a different way. They watched him. They watched him to see what he was going to do. But you know what else? Jesus watched them too. He watched them to see how they were going to respond to the very Son of God. So what are you looking for today? What did we come seeking to find? I hope we came to worship an awesome God. We came to glorify God by our very presence. I hope that we didn't come just to show people how holy we are by being in God's house. I hope we came for all of the right reasons and that was to sing the songs, to give of our tithes and offerings, to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ and then to hear the very Word of God proclaimed to us. So they watched Him. They watched Him. I hope that you and I are watching Jesus, not for the wrong reasons, not for what we expect Him to do, but for what He can do to make us a better child of God, to make us a better person. I hope we're watching Him for that and believing in Him for that. And then thirdly, thirdly, there was the healing that took place. Jesus did something they weren't supposed to do, but he didn't care who saw that. You see, Jesus in his environment, his environment or outside of his environment, he was going to do what was right. Now, another thought comes to mind when I'm right there. How do we respond when we're out of our environment? Oh, I know what we do in church. We sing the songs. We raise our hands. We clap our hands. I know we do that when we're in our in, this is our environment here. We are around godly people. We know that. So, but how do we act when we get out of our environment? When people don't know who we are. When people don't act like we act. When people don't love like we love. When people don't care like we care. When people don't believe like we believe. How do we act? Let me remind you of something. God is watching us. The people outside are watching us. And when God put us in a position outside of our environment, outside of our, for lack of a better word, click, outside of our comfort zone, He put us there for a reason. He put us there for a reason. So what I'm saying, Jesus was always Jesus wherever He was. Now you and I are a child of God. Not because we're better than anybody else, but we have accepted the fact that we were created in the image of God. We've accepted Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, and we've invited Him into our heart. So, how do we respond? What does the people see when we're out? For John, I, I thought about that in Jesus what did the Pharisees see when they were watching him? Did they actually see the Messiah, the Savior that was promised? I don't think they did. I don't think they did. They had already made up their mind before he came into the banquet that he was not the Son of God. 
They'd already made up their mind that this man is not the Messiah, that this man cannot do anything for me, but I can help him become a better person. People, my friends, are watching you and I when we're outside of our environment. And sometimes, maybe more than sometimes, God places us somewhere for a particular reason, for us to be who we are outside of our environment, regardless of what people think about us or how they may feel about us. Jesus was always Jesus wherever he was. He was the healer here in this case. The man that was there just simply uh, because they were setting up Jesus, he became the healer. And it's interesting how that went down after Jesus uh, asked the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? They didn't answer, and Jesus did the healing. And they held their peace, and Jesus did the healing, and after he had healed the sick man, he sent him away. He sent him away. Jesus knew that that wasn't where he needed to be. He knew that that was a setup. So he sent him on his way, and Jesus remained there with the uh, hypocritical Pharisees. Fourthly, the parable with advice, verses 7 through 4. Now, Jesus gave some advice. He spoke in a parable, but he was speaking to those self-righteous Pharisees that were sitting around. Let me just read a couple of verses of that. When thou art bidden to any man's wedding or party, don't always expect to be in the best seat where you'll be recognized. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what was happening here. They had picked the best seats so they would be recognized as a very righteous Pharisee. Jesus said, don't do that. He said, don't wear your religion on your shoulders, making everybody think you're holier than you really are. You just live your life and you take that second spot. Don't have to have first place. Take that second spot. Take that third spot, if you will. Be humble. I think that's what this particular part of the parable is all about. Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. Don't be self-righteous. Don't feel that, that I deserve this spot. Humble yourselves. You, you know, one of the big problems in a lot of churches today, and churches is God's movement for getting His Word out, is that we, we, become, we become somehow thinking that if we aren't comfortable with where we are, with what we're doing, or who's around us, then we feel out of place. But let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit wants to make us uncomfortable at times. When we are out of our environment, when we are out of the will of God, when we are being judgmental and we won't admit it, the Holy Spirit wants to make us uncomfortable. Hey, take a look at yourself. Take a look at yourself. That is what I'm getting out of this, but I'm not getting, out of it, getting that out of it from you. I'm getting out of that out from me. Take a look at myself and see where I fit in in this particular parable. So Jesus gave them advice, and that advice was simply to be humble. Be a very humble individual, whatever you do, whatever you are. And the last thing, the kingdom parable, one of the Pharisees asked him about, uh, said something about the supper that's going to take place. They were talking about the marriage supper that, that takes place after Jesus raptures out his church. That's what they were talking about. And Jesus used three different things. He used three different people that made three different excuses. They had been invited to a party. Now, I'm told by commenters that these invitations take place probably about a year in advance. They'd been invited to a party, but they refused. They made excuses. We've been invited to the party of Christ, so how are we fitting in? Are there times that what we're doing just don't suit us? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. But these guys, there was one that had already accepted the invitation a year earlier, and he had gone out and bought a yoke of oxen. 
Now, a yoke of oxen was two oxes, two, two bulls, and he'd gone out and bought them, but he hadn't saw them yet. He'd bought them, and he was going to see them. He simply made an excuse. I can't come. I've got something else that takes priority over Christ in my life. Another had bought a piece of land. I can't come. I'm going to see the land. Another, I just married. I can't come. I got a wife. We got to go on a honeymoon. I can't be there today. These were excuses. And I think what I wanted to pull out of this, at least for myself, what is my excuse for not doing what God wants me to do? What is your excuse for not doing what God wants you to do? Is it a legitimate excuse or is it just simply, I don't want to? I don't want to. I think that is the excuses that was being given in that final parable. So I just want to pose this question to you as we close. Could I be a Pharisee? Am I living on my righteousness? If not, I'm living on some, some a shaky ground. Could I be a Pharisee? The Pharisees thought they were right, but they were altogether wrong. Sometimes we may think we're right, but we can sometimes be altogether wrong as well. Have I become over some 40, some years of pastoring your church? Have I become a Pharisee? Now, you can't answer that for me. I've got to answer that myself. I've got to make decisions myself. If I'm not where I know I need to be, then I need to make some visits right here. If you aren't where you need to be, if you're too close to a Pharisee or an excuse giver, uh, maybe this is where you need to be right here, where you can come in this environment, where you're safe and you know that nobody is hypocritical of you. You come and have a little talk with Jesus. And I think the song goes, he'll make it right. Just have a little talk with Jesus and he will make it right. So where are you today? Are you where that you want to be? Are you satisfied with where you are in your spiritual growth? If you've accepted Christ, you are a Christian. I'm glad we live in the grace dispensation period. You've heard me say lots of times that once we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are always a Christian. But sometimes we're like the prodigal son. We drift off searching something that is not good for us. The only reason God lets us go where we're going is so that we'll realize that that's not where we want to be. Father, thank you again for our time together today. Your will be done as we continue this service, as we continue our lives in serving you as we walk out these doors. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.